Okay, yes, hello. Oh. All right? How's everyone feeling? You all right? Yeah, I thought that was, I'm quite amped up after that last one. A little bit, yeah, I feel like very motivated and actually it actually um, ties into this discussion very well because this discussion is going to be on intersectionality, um, which was probably the biggest message I was left with after Helen's amazing talk about the suffrage movement. Um, but I think we'll crack into this. Uh, uh, you know what, I think I'll let, I'll let everyone introduce themselves, because I'm cheeky like that. No, um, no, I th honestly think it's a bit more personal, so starting from the right, let's... How much do you want? Oh, how much do I, do I, I want? Uh, just a brief, yeah, just maybe like three or four lines. Okay. Hi the highlights. <laughs> And we'll crack into the conversation. The highlights. Okay. Well, my name is Ghislaine Kinoani. I am um, a psychologist. I write. And I'm very excited to be here. And my thing, I guess, is power. Your thing is power? Yeah. Yeah, All I right. like. Um, <laughs> also, yeah, also, I'm Jordan Stevens. I'm a writer, performer, um, and a general accident walking. Where there's a blame, there's a claim. Remember that, Jordan, okay? <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Shaista. Um, apologies for my squeaky voice, but, you know, the work must car carry on. Um, so I'm a writer and a journalist. Um, I do stand-up comedy. I'm also involved... I don't know why I did that, but anyway. I'm also involved <laughs> in politics. Um, I do a lot of campaigning around racism and homelessness, and they do intersect, and it's really amazing to be on this panel with these brilliant sisters, and you, of course, Jordan. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Minnie Rahman. I think we all, maybe I describe myself as a writer, um, but I'm also a migrants' rights activist and a climate activist, and a lot of the work that I do is trying to connect those conversations and how they intersect with each other. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out Sunday evening. Um, my name's Rennie Edo-Lodge. Uh, I'm a writer, journalist, I guess, an author. I wrote a book called Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, in which Yay! there was an entire chapter about intersectionality. So, yeah. All right, well, then we'll start with you. Oh, no, please don't. Um, please don't. <laughs> I think we'll begin the discussion by asking what is intersectionality. Um, and okay, I think fine, I'll I'd like everyone to. Yeah, go on. <laughs> um, well, I define it in the book um, from the work of Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who sort of, she coined the term in 1989, but I think that the concept existed in like black feminist thought and activism and writing for a good few, at least a couple of hundred years before that point. Um, and what she defined it was, was kind of like how discrimination intersects specifically with black women, um, when it comes to things like racism and sexism. Now, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, she's a legal scholar, so she was applying this to how, um, you know, essentially employment-like cases to do specifically with, like, discrimination on the grounds of racism or sexism um, were, like, inadequate for black women in particular because it's almost like they had to choose and they had to, like, choose a like-for-like -like comparison with uh, a white person or a like for like comparison with a man and what she was essentially arguing was you know these things intersect much like you know if you've ever looked at an American road grid um, where you like have those sort of like crossing points of of routes essentially um, and I think that you know black feminists over the the years the the centuries the decades have been like attempting to articulate that it isn't really good enough when we're talking about like structural discrimination to um, to silo these things because uh, I can't remember who it said. I can't remember who said this, and one of you on the panel might be able to um, to correct me. The person who said, you know, we can't have single issue campaigns because we don't live single issue lives. Audrey Lord. There you go. Thank you. Um, Boom. So yeah, that's that's my definition. I don't know if anybody else wants to add. Yeah. Does any do any of you guys want to add to that? that definition? Um, no, uh, I don't want to add to that definition, but I guess coming at it from a psychological perspective is that I have done a lot of work with um, women, marginalized people, non-binary people, and one thing that I've come up in my research is how trauma intersects as well. So, uh, for example, people who have experienced any kind of abuse when they are subjected to um, abuse in a different form 
um, related to different acts of identity, they can feel triggered in their earlier memories. So for example, I had experiences, I was exposed to experiences of um, women who had been sexually abused, for example, and who went on to experience discrimination in the workplace. And they started having nightmare of when they were um, sexually abused because of the experience of um, racism in, in the workplace. So I think it's important as well when we consider mental health or psychological well-being that we remember that trauma is also intersectional in terms of vulnerability, but also in terms of how people respond to the violence that they are exposed to. Can yeah, I just, please. Yeah, yeah. just also wanted to talk a bit about class because this country is obsessed with class even though you're never supposed to talk about class. And very horrifically, um, social justice movements in this country in particular don't ever really want to identify the fact that people of colour, um, black people, many people are part of the working class. And this narrative, and we're heading towards an election as we all know, and this narrative just continues and continues and continues. And it needs to be um, investigated and it needs to be called out. Because um, one of the reasons why we have a lot of the uh, turmoil, for want of a better word, that we're seeing in this country now and the polarization is because these narratives are based on complete falsehoods, but they keep being, um, they keep just, you know, being uh, mainstreamed every day. And we're, we're going to be hearing a lot of this in the next few weeks uh, before the election. We're going to be about hearing about divides. the white working class vote and all this other rubbish, right? And it's like, well, actually, the working class is not just white people. The working class are lots of people. They're all people. Um, I'm the proud... Do they specify... Yeah, of course, because, you know, a lot of times what we're told is um, that, you know, if to, to get the vote out in X place, usually in Northern England, for some reason, they always want to focus their attention there when it comes to the white working class, where allegedly, you know, the, the great unwashed there, um, Northerners, basically delivered a lot of the problems that we're seeing now. I'm just going to mention the word Brexit. There you go, someone had to say it. Um, but if you look at the data... Brexit? Yeah, exactly. If you look at the data, it actually shows very clearly that it's the home counties where you know large swathes of people voted for Brexit. So um, when we look at intersectionality, sometimes this word kind of gets co-opted and it gets misused, but we have to be more analytical in our own thinking and, and question the way these narratives are formed, particularly around class in a country that is absolutely obsessed with class where nobody actually wants to talk about it. Yeah, and, and just to follow on from that, um, when you talk about the white working class, it's often migrants who are pitted against the white working class, and actually migration status and having the right documents is sort of the epitome of discrimination. You know, our migration system is inherently... But racism is inherently built into that system and migrants are, especially migrants who are people of colour, are also often working class um, and also, you know, they sort of epitomise how intersectionality, like, appears in real life and it's really important when we are sort of campaigning and especially in this election that we don't look pit the white working class against migrants because actually they're both fighting against the same system which discriminates against them. Yeah, that is, excuse, I feel like it's a lot, there's a lot to, a lot to process there. Um, and I, I, I wonder what is, can, you, can someone add a little bit about the importance of there being intersectionality or recognizing intersectionality? Yeah. So in my book, uh, I speak about Tottenham in particular because I grew up in Tottenham um, and Tottenham is in a borough of London, Harringay, which is about 40% black. Um, it's probably one of the blackest areas in the country, actually. And there's also an intense and extreme like wealth divide, which is, if I remember cor correctly, based on like the west of the borough and the east of the borough, and the west of the borough is a lot whiter and a lot more middle class. So I grew up in Tottenham, and I grew up... At, uh, like, it's, it's a super multicultural upbringing, but there were, there were people I went to school with who were living in extreme poverty, you know, who were like recent immigrant families or black families, entire families living in, you know, one room. Um, and I feel like these people, you know, who ostensibly live in a safe labor seat, you know, are never considered part of the conversation when we're talking about the working class or even like the precariat or like the underclass in this country. Um, they're not even considered culturally working class. They're othered when we talk about class. So. When I was like a reporter before my book came out, um, I did a lot of housing reporting because I think social housing in particular is like, 
that's actually like social housing policy tells you how the government of the day wants to deal with class, wants to deal with pov poverty. Um, and we all know that like for over a decade we've had a social housing crisis. Um, and, and what I found was that in Haringey, in which you know Tottenham is, is part of Haringey, um, because there was like a dearth of funding towards social housing, the council were like building all this housing, but their own equalities impact report showed that there was gonna be a huge class divide in terms of who was gonna be able to access it. And that hit black people in particular, because in that context, black people were far more likely to be working class far more likely to be working class. And there's this line in the book where I say, when it comes to that context, when we're thinking about who's working class, instead of thinking about like a white northern guy in a flat cap, you should actually be thinking about like a black woman pushing a pram. Mm. Um, in, in that borough where I grew up, black women, black single mothers are more likely to be on the homelessness register than anybody else, right? So to me, that's intersection intersectionality in practice. That's how race, class, and gender, um, you know, women, uh, Angela Davis wrote this book called Women, Race, and Class, right? Like, that's how you see those three different ways of, um, of discrimination literally coming together to marginalize people from accessing, like, equality via the state, right? You know, I still, I was just in Tottenham today, right? And, and I was looking at all of the new housing going up. And I remember doing this reporting a few years back. And I remember um, what I found out when I went to go and speak to housing activists. And I was thinking, you know, around Tottenham Hale, most people who have lived here for the majority of their lives will not be able to access that housing. They just won't have the, the income to be able to access that housing. That is, like, that's an intersectional approach um, to, to see the... You know, I don't like to talk about identity politics too much because I think like it's a really dismissive term to talk about the different ways that structural discrimination like impact people's lives. But you can see in that in that context, right, how it racism and classism are coming together to push some people out eventually of the borough. Right. Yeah, I think for me it's sort of like the, in, in similar way to Renny said about identity politics, but I think when you're looking at systems and also campaigning, which is what I do, I think you have to look at a situation and think, who is the most affected by the situation? Why are they the most affected by the situation yeah. and how? Yeah. And that is essentially an intersectional approach because if you really looked at, looked at how those things were affecting people, you can see that it is usually, you know, black working class women are the most affected yeah. by housing crises and, and in the same way that people in the global south are most affected by the climate crisis and obviously they're in like working class communities too. So yeah. it's about yeah, totally. the how and the why. I think that the, the intersectionality in, in regards to politics is something that we want to open up to a wider conversation in a second. But I'm, I'm intrigued that you, you mentioned before about... Um, about trauma and the psychological effects of trauma and 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 we were speaking about there being an internet intersectionality there i thought that was quite an interesting i, I hadn't necessarily looked at trauma through an intersectional lens mm -hmm. um well a, a couple of things i'd like to say which i think when we're thinking about inter intersectionality we're thinking about vulnerability but it's important that we remember we're also talking about power. And there are reasons why certain groups are invisibilized when we're talking about um, the working class. I think it's important that we name things um, when it is, when it is um, about access to resources. What we're talking about here, we're talking about racism, we're talking about anti-blackness. And it is these processes that invisibilize black working um, class people and brown working class people because if the default is that um, either the needs of white groups need to be prioritized or the interest of white groups need to be prioritized. What it is that we are saying? I think we need to, you need to, you need to say it. We are talking about whiteness. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we don't lose sight of that. Now, the second thing about trauma and about mental health and about intersectionality is that we have at least 50 years of research, if not more, which has identified that people who tend to hit more axes of oppression are the most vulnerable within this country. So we know, for example, 
principle that black groups, regardless of gender, are the group most likely to experience mental health problems, but also the group most likely to access mental health problems through the most uh, mental health services, sorry, through the most coercive and adverse routes, through via the police, via the court, via restraints, and the most likely to be overmedicated and, and to die within system designed to, to, to care for them. We know also that, for example, since 9-11, um, Muslim people, regardless of ethnicity, have found themselves represented, overrepresented within mental health services. So when we're talking about intersectionality, we are also talking about violence, which is done to people because they are othered, because they are marginalized, and because they are uh, presented as the enemy. Totally. Yeah, and we can see that uh, in the current prime minister of this country who yeah. sees fit to um, target minority women who are a, a minority within a minority because of their choice of clothing. And as we know, this week uh, he's been called out twice by two women of colour and it has to be said a number of young women um, on television. It, the people who are calling him out very, very clearly for this are women. Um, and I don't think that's by accident, by the way, it's because we've had enough, quite frankly. Um, but the fact that this is where we are, it, as we're about to enter a new decade, tells you very clearly that beyond the next three weeks, we have a fight, the fight of our life on our hands. For those people who believe in social justice and believe genuinely in equality and believe that there is enough money sloshing around in this country and indeed other countries in this world um, for everyone to be able to live in a dignified way, these are not just nice things for someone to say you're sitting on a stage, it's just a fact, right? So we've got to look at ourselves and work out what we are going to do as individuals to make this change and what we're going to do in terms of coming together with people ask, yeah. and groups that we've never met before. Yeah, do you think there's anything that, I mean, obviously everyone's dishing out their manifestos at the moment. Are there anything, any political changes that you could, that you'd want to read that you could think would legitimately encourage that? I mean, it's like, say for example, in my mind, to start rebuilding, say, community centres, the youth centres that have been shut down for austerity, encouraging there being some kind of engagement between cultures that live next door to each other, do you know what I mean? Are there, have, have, have you been hearing anything? Cause yeah, I mean, I spend a lot of time knocking on doors, and one of the most devastating things, we were talking about this earlier as well, is there's an inherent um, level of self-hate amongst the working class in this country, and it's not happened by accident, okay? It's because of the way the narrative around the working classes is built. Now, if you just look at the last sort of seven, eight years of television, um, the kind of programs, the reality TV shows, the kind of narrative around scroungers. I mean, to this day, we don't yeah. actually see working class people on our television unless they're pulling pints or jump, jumping into each other's beds on uh, uh, soap operas, right? That disgrace that was um, the Jeremy Kyle show has been taken off oh, there, all of that. So the reason, that why yeah, the reason why I'm mentioning all of this is because this self-hatred doesn't come from out of nowhere. That's real. And what I find absolutely devastating is in the last 10 years where everything in this country has been destroyed in terms of the um, you know, the social security net and all the rest of it, right? Is people actually think this is as good as it gets. And so I'm having conversations with people, they've got nothing, right? And sometimes I'm knocking on doors and there's people are telling me about their realities and they've got no carpets and it's not because they've got hipster floorboards, by the way, but they're still t standing there saying to me, Jeremy Corbyn's really scruffy. And I'm like, okay, is that really a problem for you, sir, right? No, I'm being serious. serious. I'm being serious because the, it's billion, internalized. the billionaire internalized the media hate. is very good at selling a t certain type of narrative. So when you have progressive, transformative policies that appear in a mainstream uh, political party's manifesto, it's like a shock. It's a shock to people, right? Yeah. It's a shock that we're all supposed to have a roof over our heads, that we're all supposed to have free health care, which is not free because we're paying our tax, right? But this is the type of narrative that's coming out. So well, what, what, one thing that scares me a little bit, if we were to expand it outside of the UK as well, is, you know, you talk about Boris Johnson and, and when he stepped into being, becoming a prime minister, for me, it was like more of, I'd seen, I'd, I'd almost come to the point of acceptance. Like the, the, his, his, He's so clearly racist and he's so misogynistic. And, he, and Theresa May, actually, with the whole, um, the whole Windrush scandal, was probably one of the worst things I've seen in politics. It's like an ongoing, an ongoing, like, the, it's not the first time I'd seen someone I disliked like that. And, and, but it's just the most blatant, he, he, you can literally read things that he said. And it's reflected as well in, obviously, in America, <laughs> obviously, um, with just an absolute psychopath. 
at a point where I think we have arguably more information and ability to connect than ever, that's what freaks me out. Where do, what 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 measure needs to be taken? Like, why are these people manifesting in our societies at a point I where we should learn I think has something more? to say. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, I hear you. I always get a little bit uncomfortable when we put our emphasis and focus on individuals. Those people are born out of system yeah. and those people are supported by millions. So that's I think what I mean by manifesto, are they yeah. projections of the, of the society? Sure that, that's right, but it's society, we got them there. There are millions of people who are supporting them and I think the danger is when we have those hateful figures is to project our own, um, I would say quite collectively, bigotry onto them rather than actually kind of examine and reflect on how we are supportive, oppressive system and how we are complicit yeah. in the same system. And actually, if we were doing this thinking, I don't know that we would have those, those, those people there. The thing is that though, and I've written a piece about, this, uh, about it this morning, Boris Johnson is where he is, not despite of his racism, but because. because of his racism, people are supporting him because there is this um, narrative, there is this fallacy, there is this illusion that people with power are being silenced, that they are being gagged, that they are being the victim of political correctness, yeah. and therefore people are resisting in their minds. So whoever presents as someone who is an open mouth, unrestrained, and willing to speak whatever other people might think is going to get some support. So what we want to do is actually ask people to use or perhaps educate people on critical thinking, on power, on dominance, on domination, on history, so that we have a shot uh, at getting them to see what is happening around them. Otherwise, they're just going to be fed whatever the government is giving them. Boy. Jeez. Yeah, I agree. Um. Anyone's got anything to add to that? Um, in terms of policy, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, like everything Gillen said, and I think intersectionally, in, in, intersectionality helps you think about your own role. If you think in an intersectional way, it helps you think about the way your own identity plays into those oppressive roles. And I think when it comes to politics, part of the reason that we have gotten to this situation is not only because we haven't been thinking in an intersectional way, but it's also because we've been afraid to stand up for the rights of groups who are oppressed. So part of the reason we've got into a Brexit situation is because we've pitted migrants against the white working yeah. class and we've been afraid to stand up for migrants' rights, and that is a thing that has happened across most, not only political movements, but in every political party too, and I think it's really important that we look at how we got to where we are, and then think about how we can stop doing that, and how we can make progress. And I would say, in terms of thinking about this in a policy way, and how you vote, um, for me, I, th I think what's important is, like, I would like to live in a country where there's less suspicion. I would like to live in a country in which um, yeah. people understand that um, perhaps the reason why it appears that migrants are stealing jobs is not actually to do with them, but more to do with like uh, Thatcher's attempts at like the decimation of labor rights in the 80s, like trying to destroy unions, um, meaning, that, meaning that like it became convenient for people to, of, to run businesses to actually like undermine um, by hiring cheap labor and that cheap labor comes through um, that that cheap labor comes through of a, like a situation in which um, people in other countries are having to essentially flee poverty and we can think in a more like broader way about Britain's role our in that responsibilities, yeah. and, and, our, and our responsibilities as well um, and I think that again you know it has to come down to power. But in like, if we like have had like 30 years, and we have kind of had like 30 years at this point of like thinking about like politics and our obligations to society and what society owes us in this kind of like scarcity mindset. Um, and you always see that when um, the tabloids decide that we're gonna hate this one particular woman with four kids who's claiming 30 grand off the state, um, when actually that's a one single person's salary and she's, do, she's a superhero for doing that, <laughs> not a scrounger. Um, I think that we should actually be th thinking about it as an abundance mindset. You know, we should, 
we should be thinking that actually we are one of the richest countries in the world. Why do yeah. we continue to live in a in a country in which there's whole families living in one room? That's weird, isn't it? Like we need to start thinking about of it of an abundance mindset. So like when Empirical. it comes to me voting, I'm thinking, okay, well, I don't want whole families living in in one room. Like and and so I'm going to vote for policies in which that does that doesn't become the case. And I don't want to live in a society where people are thinking in this case of scarcity and like people are looking at their next door neighbour and being like, oh well, they've got this and I don't it's have that. It's, there's got to be uh, there's got to be. I mean, you're talking, you, yeah. You got there's got to be like a some kind of psychological parallel to the just decrease in empire and just the reality that the world is evolving and changing and people are shifting because uh, that's that's what i think the manifestation is, is is that you you go to school and you're taught a history that basically is always nationalist so in all these countries it's like you know a white man did this right i i left my school as a white supremacist white male supremacist because <laughs> i was like right so like thomas Edison, the light bulb winston churchill won all the wars abraham lincoln's three the slaves uh and then i think i remember learning about florence nightingale but it wasn't she wasn't even considered to be like this heroic she's like a nurse you know a nurse um and so that mentality i think breeds into a whole culture you know, like I think it breeds into how we consume the information we're said because there's something in the back of a British mind that we are entitled to other people's space. Yeah, I really don't think that we can give, you know, North Korea's education too much um, grief uh, when we actually <laughs> look at how we do or even don't teach colonialism Trust me. <laughs> in this it's country. It's bizarre. It's literally... Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, there's this word that I learned in school called jingoism. It's like uncritical patri patriotism. Yeah, and it's and it's and it's it's actually echoed throughout Europe. I did a, a, a bizarre course on I say bizarre course on journalism. It was bizarre that I was there on the course on journalism, um, but it, it is this a similar thing. It was like it almost seems like a it, it's in the curriculum in order for the, the children of that space. Whereas if you were to just teach further back, say Spain for example, didn't even speak of like the Arabic roots of Spain. So then if you're being confronted with people who don't look like the Spanish people you've seen, you consider them to be alien to you. But I, the question I wonder is, if you were taught f truthfully enough about the history of your country, you wouldn't be able to accept terms like swarm or accept terms like because you understand these people as contributing mm. to your existence. Do you well, know no, I'm not dictating how anybody vote, but I'm just saying that the Labour Manifesto says that they're <laughs> going to start teaching <laughs> black history and colonialism on the national curriculum. Really? Yeah, so Rate that. that may influence my vote. <laughs> Do you think that with, from a side... <laughs> just saying. Yeah, for real. Um, but yeah, for, from a psychological, do you agree with that? that, that concept? I, I, I do agree. I think there is there is an African proverb, and I don't know whether it's Ghanaian. Certainly, I saw it in Ghana, and it says, "Until the lions have their historian, the story will always glorify the hunters," or something along this line. So there's something about who writes. It's something about um, who gets to establish the narrative. There's something, therefore, about power. There's some, again, I told you power is my thing. Yeah. Epistemic power. Um, so we <laughs> need to ask those questions. But to go back to the point about internization um, of oppression, I think this is a phenomenon that is absolutely normal and actually not pathological because marginalized group, all marginalized group, internalize social structure. In fact, dominant groups do that as well. The trouble, of course, is that when, when marginalized group internalize that, they inter internalize a sense of self-contempt and inferiority. And we see, that, we see that with class, we see that with race, we see that with gender as well. And I guess it's a natural uh, consequences of living in a white supremacist, misogynistic, classist society where people have to adapt and they are fed the discourse that to be is to be male, to be is to be middle class, to be is to be um, is to be white. So in that context, of course, people are going to aspire to that. To change that fundamentally, we need to change the structure. Changing the narrative is not going to do because people are going to go out in the world and realize who holds the money, who has the power. Structure and what? It's change the structure. Like give one we need to, we need to, we need to do one. I think one or two things. The first thing is. Perhaps we define what we define as successful, what we redefine as power, what we define as yeah, um, a history, or we need to completely redistribute social resources uh, so that they are uh, more equally distributed. That is the only two way that we are going to shift what goes on in people's head. Yeah, 
And that's... Um, Smashed. Thank you, Kalen. And that's what this Labour Party manifesto is presenting. But look at the way it's been um, internalised and interpreted by the mainstream media. What was it that uh, the, the, the thought of everybody having access to broadband, for example, kind of sent a lot of people into a tailspin, right? Well, yeah, because sometimes you go to the countryside to get no service, to get away from the internet. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> if you're always... Sorry, carry on. Um, but I think at the heart of this is the structural change that's needed um, yeah. and education is absolutely the crux of this like if you you know you go to school in this country you don't learn about the empire you learn about the industrial revolution yeah. because the only revolution this country's ever had is when we sent more working class kids up the chimney pots to clean them out right Jeez. and in, right, while the rest of Europe was like burning tyres and you know throwing bricks or whatever they were doing <laughs> uh, this was what this was the revolution that this country had and I, it's not by accident that you don't teach kids about empire it's not That's it's right. not done by accident it's a deliberate engineered move and it's all about making you understand and your place, which this country again is obsessed with. We're all supposed to know our place. We're all supposed to like fit into our boxes. And the minute we don't, you're, they're going to come for you, right? Well, the thing is, you know, all of that needs to shift, and it is shifting. And this is why we're seeing the level of backlash and the so-called culture wars that are going on because university students excellent professors, lecturers, they're coming together now and saying enough is enough, we need to change the curriculum, it's happening in schools as well, and the, the job of the rest of us is to support those people. Right, so that would be, oh yeah, all right, come on. <laughs> totally. Um, you know, you can vote for who you want. Uh, no. <laughs> You can't vote for who you, you know, want, we're but not take promoting. We're not out here promoting. Take responsibility for who they you vote for. They just have a better manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but genuinely, uh, that is uh, what, to wrap this up, because it's been an incredible discussion, and thank you everyone um, on the panel. Uh, yeah, as a suggestion of how we can improve intersectionality within our communities, I think that was a great example. You've, you've, you've given one. Yeah, you, yeah, you gave an example. Um, <laughs> Minnie and, uh, and Rennie, if you, yeah, just, just or maybe a, just a suggestion of a solution in the future. Uh, I think one of the most important things to do is actually centralise the voices of marginalised communities. And I think as a society and a community, we're really bad at actually putting the people affected by various crises in the limelight and giving them the space to have their voices heard. So if you're like a campaigner or someone who works for a political party, I think it's really important to like think about intersectionality and think about who you're not hearing from and why you're not hearing from yeah. them and how you can make their voices heard. Yeah. Yeah, I think I would just say um, when it comes up to this election, just think critically and be wary of uh, media narratives that try to convince you that things are actually not the way that they are. I think f for me particularly, being somebody who comes from uh, a, a very working class back background and somebody who's also an anti-racist, I think that we need to be particularly careful and wary of conversations about class that try to pretend that the real authentic like sort of the earth people um, who are struggling in this country are white to the point where they actually become a liberation group of them their own um, I think we need to just be really careful to to not fall for those narratives and mm. And I don't think that's that difficult. You know, we're all going to leave this building later. We're going to walk around King's Cross and we're going to see, like, the communities that we move around and realise that that isn't true. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah. I think it's... it's the general message, I think, is, is establishing which voice is your own or, or, or truly reflective of your community and being able to differentiate between that and the voices that have been maybe handed to you by your education and the media, which we need to just generally fucking ignore. Yeah. And it's, and it's really basic. If you believe in your own humanity, you need to believe in everyone else's humanity. If you believe in your human rights, you need to believe in everyone else's human rights. If you're going to be selective about it, then you don't believe in any yeah. of that. Wicked. Minnie, Rennie, Ghislaine, Shaista, thank you so much. Yes.